So I've started recording now. Okay. So welcome everyone. We are now in week seven and tonight we have our tutorial which will be devoted to listening to one of the presentations by one of the groups uh, which is the one about Julian Assange. I was trying to look for the name of your group. I couldn't find it. So we've got uh, Marina, Dean, Rice, and Siobhan, who will be presenting tonight. Uh, if we have more time, then we will, I think we will have a lot of time. So we will uh, cover two other tutorial questions, which I have posted in Moodle. And uh, yeah, let me, let me begin by saying before the group does this presentation that after going over the written submission that you made in the Word document, I am very impressed by the quality of the, both the factual background as well as the quality of the questions. So the questions in particular were quite creative and were very compelling. And they would actually force the reader to think about um, international law principles and I'm very pleased about the fact that you were able to ask questions, not directly linked to the facts themselves, but to be able to go beyond uh, the factual background. Like, you know, you were asking about what if this happened, what then happened? So uh, I, I would definitely say that I'm very happy with, with what was submitted and I look forward to the presentation that you will be making tonight. Now, uh, let me just request the group to begin the presentation by first introducing yourselves. And then as a reminder, uh, please try to speak slowly, especially if, yeah, because um, the, the amount of information and the factual background might be quite a lot and it will take a while for some of us to absorb all of them. So take your time in speaking, don't rush, so we can really follow through what you have been saying. So having, and um, was there, does, I mean, I, I would assume that one of you actually has an access to the PowerPoint slides that you sent to me. Who has it? Uh, it's Dean. Dean, okay, so Dean, um, when you're ready, just, uh, just use the share screen function of Zoom to be able to share your PowerPoint slides with the rest of the, of the class. Okay, so having said that, um, I now leave, uh, give the floor to the group to make its presentation concerning the case of Julian Assange. Um, sorry, uh, it, uh, Manjo, it's staying. I've uh, had to dial in my phone. Um, can one of my other group members be able to share the screen? They've all got the presentation. You, you got you, you were getting cut off uh, Dean I quite I, I couldn't really hear what you were saying Banjo, I'll try and do it Dean's okay. calling in from the phone. Oh, okay. mm. so, as, as I said I'm going I'm going to mute everyone if you need to say anything and mute yourself because there's a lot of background noise that I could hear okay so uh, who will begin the presentation from the group I will. I'm just trying to figure out how I share my screen. Okay, so open up your PowerPoint first. Open it first, and then there is a share screen function. Oh, hang on. I'm going to have to get out of the share screen function. Yours, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Okay, there. Okay, can everybody see the presentation slide? couldn't see it. You can't see it. Okay. All righty. This is a share screen function. Uh, yeah. Uh, Angela, it's Marina. I'm just, uh, oh, with the share screen. Okay, I'll try. I can try. Mm -hmm. Siobhan, do you want me to try? Um, yes, please, Marina. Okay.
sorry, I'm just I'm just looking for it. Sorry, Maju, we're just assuming that we're sending it to you and you will be able as a host to uh, Did, share it. I, I don't think people so, send it to me. Did you send it to me? Yeah, we did send it to you. Hang on. Yours is just this Didn't crew. Send it. Just this crew. Yes, it was ah, okay, today. Okay. No, yeah. I have it. I have it. Sorry. I got confused. You have it. Okay. I have it. So, uh, That's why we, we just thought that you we won't be um, yeah. sort of as a host, like we won't be able to sort of like have Why power over the screen. Yeah. Right. Okay. Sorry. So hang on. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share screen now. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Thank you, Manjo. Okay, so thank you everybody for coming today. We are Justice Crew. It's myself, Siobhan Makin, Reese Cochran, Dean Johnson, and Marina Kreese. And we've been looking at the case of Julian Assange. And while we're discussing the case and giving you our presentation, we would like you to keep in the back of your mind whether you would come down on the side of whether Julian Assange is a victim or whether he's a villain. So if I can ask you for the next slide, please, Manjo. Okay, my PowerPoint uh, software has hung. Okay. okay, so I will start anyway. So where it all began was Julian Assange co-founded WikiLeaks in 2006. The purpose of WikiLeaks was to make public previously unaccessible information such as government documents and make people in government and government agencies accountable for their actions and more transparent in their um, dealings. So this has caused some consternation, as you would imagine, with um, political forces around the world. In particular, the US seems to have um, much chagrin over the issue. So WikiLeaks has since become a forum for people to access information, mainly other journalists. So when WikiLeaks makes a publication, lots of other journalists jump on that information and run with it as their own stories. So the situation that has occurred is Although WikiLeaks may have been the initial instigator of releasing information, thousands of journalists around the world are also releasing that sometimes classified documentation. So Julian Assange went to Sweden in 2010 to speak at a conference and at a seminar. While he was there, he wanted to investigate the opportunity of getting residency in Sweden and making Sweden a base for WikiLeaks. There were a couple of reasons for this. Is one, the storage facilities and um, security that um, Sweden offered to WikiLeaks as a possible base for their information and their servers. Um, he was actually ultimately declined residency, but that's kind of by the by now. So while he was in Sweden, he stayed at a woman's house. He didn't know the woman, he'd never met her. And she was, I believe in Germany at the time, she was a supporter of his and had contacted his contacts in Sweden and offered up her place for him to stay. She came home early and of course they met, they went out to dinner, they went to the movies and they ended up having sex. So there's a little bit of, um, mystery as to what exactly happened. There are reports that the sex was rough, that he wore a condom, but it split. And needless to say, she wasn't too happy, but continued to be his friend, continued to let him stay with her. A couple of days later, approximately three days later, he met a second woman. He had sex with her, and um, she had concerns about the fact that he was a little bit rough, and she wasn't too happy, but still stayed friends with him. They actually threw a dinner in his honor about four days later before he left for the UK. Both women were concerned about the fact that um, their sex was unprotected and wondered if they could force him to take an STD screen. So they went to the police station, 
asked for this screen to be done. And um, lo and behold, it ended up being an investigation into rape, coercion and sexual molestation. So after investigations and an initial arrest, he wasn't questioned, he wasn't um, brought into the police station for questioning or interrogation, and he was allowed to leave for the UK. Can we have the next slide, please? So nevertheless, even though the prosecutor wanted to continue, um, it was later found that she didn't have enough evidence uh, to continue with the charges. The case was dropped. He left, went back to the UK. Another Swedish prosecutor came into the role and decided they wanted to proceed with the investigation. Still, there was no charges laid, but a warrant for his arrest was placed in the UK and they wanted to have him extradited back to Sweden. He was afraid of being unextradited to the US to face espionage charges over the leaking by Chelsea Manning of government documents relating to um, the Iraq war. His extradition case failed and so he was placed under arrest. He was on house arrest. Sometime later he broke that bail and ended up seeking sanctuary in the Ecuadorian embassy where he applied for asylum. He was granted it, but he remains at the asylum because a police watch was put outside the asylum, costing approximately 20 million over the years. That is no longer the case. The police have been removed um, because if he steps outside, he'll be arrested for breaking his bail and could still be unextradited to the US or to Sweden. Um, despite a six year delay, he has now been formally interviewed at the embassy but still no charges, char excuse me, charges have been laid. Chelsea Manning, who originally broke the news of um, the documents to WikiLeaks uh, back in 2010, is currently serving a 35 year sentence in the US for releasing that information to WikiLeaks. So I believe he has just cause to be concerned about an extradition onto the US. The next person that is going to speak today is Rhys Cochran, and he will talk to you about issues of extradition and treaties. Thank you, Rhys. Thank you, Siobhan. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm just going to quickly talk about the uh, European arrest warrant system, which is uh, a way of extraditing um, people wanted on charges throughout the United, uh, the European Union. Uh, a little bit about the rules and principles that apply. Possible UK-US extradition that might apply to Julian Assange and then extradition from Sweden if he was actually to be first extradited to Sweden. So possible extradition from Sweden onto the US. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, the, the European Arrest Warrant, or EAW, is issued, was issued against Assange to return him to the UK, from the UK to Sweden, so that the Swedish prosecutor could question him. Remember, there was no questions by the Swedish prosecutor at any stage, in fact. Assange then unsuccessfully contested this EAW in the UK Supreme Court. And you can look at that uh, judgment at Assange and Swedish Prosecutor Authority. The citation is there. After losing this appeal, he sought protection in the Ecuadorian embassy, stating that he feared extradition to the US if he was to move to Sweden. The European arrest warrant itself replaced complex extradition procedures within the Europeans, uh, European Union's territory. It improves and simplifies procedures to surrender people for the purpose of conducting criminal prosecutions or executing custodial sentences and detentions. It offers faster and simpler procedures to, and an end to political involvement. So, for example, one, one snag that a lot of extraditions hit uh, previously was that EU member countries would claim that uh, a citizen was one of their nationals and so could not be extradited. Well, the EAW uh, removes this barrier. Can I have the next slide, please? 
Okay, just, just looking at the EAW as a treaty, uh, I know that we looked at this earlier in the, in the term, uh, the idea of treaties. Uh, it's an instrument to create international law, yeah? So Article 2 of the 69 uh, Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties defines a treaty as an international agreement concluded between states in written form and governed by international law, whether embodied in a single instrument or in two or more related instruments and whatever its particular designation. So just pulling that apart, really, uh, I, I think there's four or five key factors there that make the EAW quite clearly a, a treaty for our concerns. Um, there, there is an agreement between member states. And they are the countries of the European Union. Uh, it's definitely in written form. It is an international agreement uh, and it is governed by international law. Uh, now, the fact it's not called a treaty is, is of no real concern uh, because according to Article 2 of the BL, BCLT, uh, an international agreement is considered a treaty, whatever its particular designation. Uh, so despite not being called a treaty, the EAW still meets this definition. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, the European arrest warrant was established by the EU framework decision in 2002. And framework decisions are legal instruments in the European community, but they only take effect when implemented in the respective EU member states that are signatories to them. Okay, so you might want to compare that with the incorporation principle in Australia of how international law is incorporated into domestic law here. And uh, you, normally that takes place when uh, legislation is passed through the Commonwealth Parliament adopting that international law as a law of Australia. Uh, an interesting case there is Minister for State and Immigration Affairs, Ethnic Affairs and TO, 1995. Uh, although that's a domestic case, I think it really highlights the principle of, of ratification or, or adopting the, uh, the EAW system. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, the, the EAW or extraditions system within the European Union uh, was set up to try and guarantee fair trial and fundamental rights. Those included the right to in interpretation and translation during criminal proceedings, the right of suspects to be informed of their own rights, uh, the right to have access to a lawyer, and the right of persons to custody and, and in custody to communicate with family members and employers. There should be a presumption of innocence and there should be a, a right to legal aid. And I, I suggest any, anybody thinking about the case of Julian Assange here might want to think whether or not those fundamental guarantees that the EAW framework set down were actually followed in his case. Next slide, please. Sorry. Oh. Assange obviously is also concerned about extradition to the United States, and that can happen directly from the United Kingdom under the 2003 UK-US Treaty on Extradition. And that was ratified in 2007. In the US, it's the, actually the US Constitution that gives the president the power to negotiate and approve treaties. However, Senate approval is required, and this causes delays before ratification. As you can see, there was a four-year delay between the UK-US Treaty and its ratification up. Can I have the next slide, please? Once moved to Sweden under the EAW system, uh, there could be further extradition from Sweden to the US of Julian Assange. And this is really the critical aspect to the whole case and what he continues to be worried about. Extradition occurs under the Extradition for Criminal Offences Act. And this is a Swedish act based on the 1957 European Convention on Extradition. Sweden will permit extradition, provided the act for which extradition is requested 
is equivalent to a crime that is punishable under Swedish law by imprisonment for at least one year. Extradition may not be granted for military or political offences. And that's from section four and five of that act. I'll now hand over to Dean Johnson. And the next slide, please, man. Hello, Manjo, do you hear me? I could, yes. Thank you. On the 19th of June, 2012, Julian Assange walked into the Ecuadorian embassy in London and applied for asylum. Citing violations of his human rights, he essentially feared for his safety, his integrity, and conceivably his life if he was extradited to Sweden and subsequently to the USA. In August, after reviewing Assange's position, Ecuador granted Assange asylum, adding that they agreed with his belief, reasoning that his concerns were legitimate and he will likely face political prosecution if he was to be extradited. Using the principle of jurisdiction, the Ecuadorian embassy is considered to be part of Ecuador's sovereignty and therefore cannot be entered without significant reason. Next slide, please, Manjo. This is the foundation principle for diplomatic relations and the customary law for countries across the world. As you can see, Article 22 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, 1961, clearly specifies that the premises of a diplomatic mission is invaluable and cannot be entered without express provision by, of the head of the mission. If Assange was also a member of the diplomatic staff, uh, he would also he would be able to be declared a person non grata under Article 9 of the Convention and his removal may be requested by the UK government. Slide change, please, Manjo. So why doesn't the UK just disregard the Convention? Firstly, uh, let's look at asylum can be granted in several ways. It can be granted territorially through stepping foot on another country's soil or a form of diplomatic asylum by seeking refuge in an embassy. Diplomatic asylum, asylum is not protected in international law and the International Court of Justice residing on cases such as Colombia versus, and Peru gives guidance that the outcome should ideally be negotiated by the concerned countries. There is a treaty on diplomatic asylum, the Caracas Convention, with many South American countries being signatories to it. Historically, the convention was created to protect migrant workers and by express provision does not make it unlawful to grant asylum to someone with criminal charges pending and expressly states the right to transfer them out of the country. The UK has expressly stated that they are not a signatory to the convention and therefore have an obligation to arrest Assange once he leaves the embassy. Fire change, please, Manjo. The convention that protects Assange, the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, has provisions that, uh, that state it must not be utilised to interfere with the internal affairs of the residing state and must be compatible with the functions of the mission. This is a balance for a resolution that must be negotiated. The alternative being are solutions such as the UK entering the embassy by force, which would create a dangerous precedent. The UK also has the ability to cut diplomatic ties with Ecuador um, and when that happens, the inviolability of the embassy is removed and all diplomatic personnel, staff and Assange would have to leave the country. The Diplomatic and Consular Premises Act of 1987, UK Act, Section 1, Subsection 3 states that this may be done with, when the Secretary of State withdraws the authorisation of the land as a diplomatic or consular post and it thereby ceases to be a premise for the rule of international law. Of note uh, is that the Secretary of State in the UK is by the UK Acts Interpretation Act, can be a cabinet minister in charge of any department. Um, and followers of international news would know that Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs is currently Boris Johnson for the UK. However, the severing of diplomatic ties and making all diplomatic personnel leave the country is an extreme measure and has not been used to date and will likely forever change the customary law of diplomatic immunity. Thus, while remaining in the Ecuadorian embassy, Julian Assange, has the protection of the Vienna Convention of Diplomatic Relations, providing immunity to the Ecuadorian diplomatic mission and premise. Next slide, please, Mando. And the final will be Marina Kreis. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, we just thought that from a uh, subject of immunity, it would be important in the case of Julian Assange to touch base on arbitrary detention. Um, so what I wanted to talk about is the functions of the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. 
uh, who actually provided the report, uh, the opinion on uh, Julian Assange being arbitrarily detained, um, Ecuadorian embassy protection, and disagreement of the UK with the opinion of the working group. Next slide, please. Uh, so the first subject is uh, what it is working group on arbitrary detention. Um, it is UN governed body of independent human rights experts and it was established by the former Con Commission of Human Rights. So its functions include investigating cases on arbitrary de uh, depri deprivation of liberty and obviously acting of, on information received and appealing to the governments involved to investigate the conditions of detainees, particularly in our case, Julian Assange. And also they try to deliberate in order to assist governments to prevent or cease the practice of arbitrary detention. Next slide. So here is Assange holding the opinion of um, United Nations report of the Working Group on uh, Arbitrary Detention. Next slide. So the main thing why uh, Ecuadorian embassy uh, granted him asylum, it actually resembles the opinion of the Working Group on Julian Assange. What their opinion is that he's subjected to arbitrary detention, uh, three parts in this detention, his imprisonment for 10 days in isolation in prison in London, also house arrest for 550 days, and his current confinement in Ecuadorian embassy. Why they think this detention is arbitrary is because he was held in isolation during his imprisonment, and because they, dis, uh, they thought that Swedish prosecution lacked diligence in the investigation, which is why the detention is so long. So authorities for, that they use, the international authorities, is uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. What they requested from the government of the UK is um, that Assange is entitled to his freedom, so he needs to walk free from the Ecuadorian embassy without being threatened to be arrested, and he's also entitled, entitled to compensation. Uh, obviously, this opinion was sent to the governments of Sweden and the UK uh, on 22nd of January 2016. Next slide. So this is where Julian Assange is currently uh, living in Ecuadorian embassy. Next slide. So the main question is why um, Ecuadorian embassy granted asylum to Julian Assange. So the question of immunity is flowing um, from this question of arbitrary detention uh, because immunity, Ecuadorian embassy has this immunity as a sovereign nation. So it has nothing to do with Assange, uh, but the, they granting asylum to Assange and obviously he is protected. Um, so the embassy of Ecuador also believes that Assange have been subjected to human rights violations in the form of arbitrary detention. So they completely agree with working um, group on arbitrary detention. And they uh, have the responsibility to take in people fleeing from political prosecution. This is in accordance with the Constitutional Republic of Ecuador. Sweden and UK also refused to commit not to extradite Julian Assange to United States. And this is another reason why they um, can't allow them to arrest him. And if extradited to United States, Assange's rights could be violated even further. He could be subjected to political prosecution of over the secret documents leaked on the WikiLeaks website. Next slide.
And on the other side, it's important to cover why UK disagrees with the opinion of working group um, on arbitrary detention and why they don't, do not commit to it, although it is based on international law and human rights law. So UK has a legal obligation to extradite Assange to Sweden due to the Extradition Act 2003. Also, they claim that Assange is avoiding lawful arrest by remaining in Ecuadorian embassy. The Supreme Court of the United Kingdom has affirmed his extradition order to Sweden on the allegations of coercion, rape and sexual molestation. And also another reason is Assange has breached the conditions of his bail because he left his house for the purpose of seeking the asylum at Ecuadorian embassy in London. And this is subject to arrest under the Bail Act 1976. So this, is, this covers the arbitrary detention. And now I think Siobhan wanted to conclude our presentation. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, um, everybody in Justice Crew, for your fine participation and work on this project. I know we've all had such a lot of fun doing it. It's been very, very interesting. I would like to conclude the presentation by leaving you, we, you with a few thoughts. So, after his initial um, questions in November the 14th and 15th in London at the embassy by way of an interpreter, Julian Assange's lawyer came out and spoke to the press and she said even if the Swedish prosecutor didn't lay charges and chose to drop the investigation, which they fully expected would happen because no further evidence has taken place and in 2010 they stated that there was not enough evidence to proceed with the prosecution against him. Extradition to the US is still a very real possibility, either via Sweden, if they got him to Sweden and then dropped the case, or through the UK authorities. So there's another question to be asked. If Julian Assange does happen to be arrested, does happen to be extradited onto the US, in what way is he different from every other reporter of every national newspaper, every network in the country who has since gone on and released the same documents um, from the US military in their reports and in their opinion pieces. So whether you think Julian Assange is a victim or a villain, there are bigger consequences and it would be very interesting to see with this, where this all leads. As yet, he has not been charged with anything. I'd like to open the floor now to any questions that you have, and we'll all try and answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Shoban. Thank you uh, to the rest of the group members. Uh, let me just make a comment before uh, I, I, leave, I give the floor to the class to ask questions or provide other comments. So I could see the amount of uh, preparation that this group made uh, for this presentation. Well done. Uh, Reese in particular, I like the fact that he's dressed up as, you know, in, in proper attire, like a lawyer. Very good. Um, thank you. So, uh, yeah. So, and um, in terms of the use of uh, images and the amount of uh, text that was used in the PowerPoint presentation, obviously uh, helped. Uh, facilitate the understanding of the uh, very complex and controversial issue relating to Julian Assange. So I thank the group uh, for doing well both in the uh, submission of the Word document as well as the Zoom presentation. So well done. And thank having you. said that, um, I, I'd like to uh, flag the other groups who will probably be viewing this recording to ensure that you kind of uh, do your presentation within the time limits. We're only fortunate tonight that there is only one group presenting because had there been two or had there been three, uh, we would have had problems because uh, this, the Justice Crew group exceeded uh, the, the time allocated. For them. But that hasn't really been an issue, mainly because there's only one group presenting tonight. 
So, so again, it's just a reminder to the succeeding groups who will be doing their own presentations to please uh, do your presentation within the allotted time. So having uh, given those comments, we now uh, give the floor to the rest. Is my video still off? Sorry about that. So we now leave uh, the floor open to any one in the class to ask questions or make some comments. I've got a question, if, um, if I may. Go ahead, Peter. I'm just uh, wondering uh, if Julian Assange has been given advice or even just putting myself in his mind, if he obviously feels he's uh, a victim at this stage, and many people do, uh, if he was prepared to step out and say, right, I'm here, um, who wants me and um, let's get this thing um, opened up and I'm happy to cooperate with um, Sweden. I'm happy co to cooperate with the United States if they need me or want to extradite me. But um, um, and, and, and so the focus of the attention would turn not from him, it would turn on to the the states who are wanting to uh, quiz and interview him and charge him. And so there'd be a lot of scrutiny taken off him and put on the um, states. Um, yeah, that's my question and suggestion. Um, I can answer that, Peter. He has actually the entire six years that he's been held um, with this hanging over his head, he's never once um, not been willing to cooperate. The only thing he wasn't willing to do was to be sent back to Sweden for fear of extradition to the US. His reason for being fearful of the US is well grounded and sorry there's a little bit of interference in the background, is well grounded and um, he also doesn't trust that he will receive a fair trial there. Um, the, U.S. seem to have been very secret about um, what they intend to do. They've not released any information. They're being very vague about it. All they will say is they're interested in investigating him. So he doesn't know what charges could possibly be laid before him other than a loosely it being related to espionage charges. Um, and I think he's rightly fearful. Um, Chelsea Manning is currently serving a 35-year very difficult sentence. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jason Manning has also had um, his um, um, medication denied to him. Um, Chelsea Manning was um, Bradley Manning, and um, he is a transgender person who relies on um, a certain amount of um, medical treatment in order to maintain his female status, and that's being denied to him. So I think he's got very real um, justified fears in that regard. Um, he has had no uh, compunction about answering questions and as soon as they the Swedish prosecutor came to London he cooperated fully he in fact made a statement with that regard and if you have a look at our website um, it gives the statement that he made himself at the embassy um, just prior to answering those questions okay yeah thanks thanks for that Siobhan it uh, reminds me of the other Gentleman, I think his name's Snowden, uh, who's uh, in Russia in uh, asylum uh, protection in Russia for a similar charge of espionage or or giving state secrets away from the US. Um. Can I just add something there? Um, in terms of uh, Julian Assange doesn't really know what the US is going to do to him, and and one of the reasons for that is that. The Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution requires that anyone charged with a felony must be indicted by a grand jury. And this, however, is, is a prelude, while it's a prelude to a trial, it, it's not a trial itself. The, those proceedings are meant to be in secret and, and uh, in order to protect the reputation of the accused and witnesses. So I'll repeat that, that the grand jury proceedings or, you know, the precursor to any indictment are meant to be in secret. And, and this is really the reason why 
Julian Assange is, is mistrusting of the United States uh, officials because he just doesn't know what they're cooking up for him. Um, and um, the accused is often not rep represented at the, uh, at the grand jury trial. And that's, that's a good reason why he's unaware of the charges or any investigations that are ongoing in the United States about him. So it's really a situation of, does he want to uh, test the water and, and jump out of the lines down and into the fire uh, and, and face the, the might of the United States government? Um, I'm sure a lot of other people who have tried that uh, have, have failed. And um, just looking at situations like Guantanamo Bay, David Hicks, for example, um, it, it might be a poor idea to, to just leave the Ecuadorian embassy uh, on the hope of, you know, standing up for justice, especially in the face of such a powerful enemy. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, uh, for asking uh, those questions and uh, the answers that were provided as well by the group. Any other questions from the class before I start shooting off my own questions? Uh, just in addition to Peter's question. Yes. Um, thanks for answering that, guys. That was great. Um, I wonder what long-term options there are for Julian Assange. Is he planning on just waiting out his life in the Ecuadorian embassy or are they willing to keep him there for that long or has there been any discussion about what might happen? Well, I, I might attempt to answer that, um, especially given the change of president in the United States uh, just recently. I think they're, they're looking for a political uh, solution to the problem uh, and, and assurances from the United States government and the Australian government that he won't be, uh, his extradition won't be facilitated onwards to the United States. But they don't have those assurances at the moment, obviously. Look, I might just add on that, you know, the, um, Bob, Senator Bob Carr tried to get those assurances through the um, the US government and uh, they they have yet been quite tight-lipped on actually what they're actually um, cooking up. They don't really deny, they don't um, agree with it. But as far as you can do that, he's, he's not alone in, um, in seeking asylum at an embassy. There was another case of um, Cardinal Jans Jansif. I'm not going to try and pronounce his last name, but he was in the US embassy in Budapest for 19, about 19 years hmm. um, before he was released. Or, or he's, he wasn't released, he's, uh, his departure was negotiated um, to, to leave the country. Thank you, so I'll just add. I'll just add on Julian Assange with Australian side, because after releasing working group opinion, um, as before that, Australia didn't really support them, him, but after releasing that opinion, they're actually looking into different legal options. That's what, what Julie Bishop came out and said. So they're actually looking into different ways of cooperation and uh, may, maybe giving him more support. So uh, we'll see what happens. Thank you. Um, so thank, thanks for the engagement so far. I'd like to ask a few questions for the purpose of just... Uh, giving us an opportunity to amplify on some of the international law principles. Uh, again, as I said, um, I'm very impressed with the presentation so far, but I'll be asking a few questions just for the purpose of uh, getting a deeper understanding of certain international law principles. Let me begin by asking a question about the European arrest warrant. Is that a treaty? Is that a convention? Uh, yes, it was. Um, and in, in the slide presentation, I, I went through the, the reasons why we consider it to be a treaty. Um, so, I'll just sorry, um, I'm just going to cut you off. Is that covered by the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties? I believe so, yes. Uh, is that actually an agreement between states? You mentioned it's, I, I'm not very familiar with it, but you mentioned a decision a framework decision so what is that is that a framework decision or is that an agreement it's it's an agreement between the members of the european union ah so there's actually an agreement 
Yes, it's it's okay. the framework. It's like a foundation agreement, which is then meant to be ratified by each state individually. I see. Okay, that that was helpful. Now, assuming that um, the European arrest warrant was actually something that was entered into between states of the European Union and the European Union itself. Okay, assuming. I'm just making an assumption here. So assuming that the European arrest warrant was in fact an agreement between members of the European Union, meaning the states, and the European Union itself as an institution, the question is, would that agreement, which is a convention under international law, would that agreement be covered by the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties? In that case, no. Why, why not? Uh, because it needs to be uh, an agreement between states. I see. Very good. Now, the, the other... The European Union is not such. Very good. The, question, the, the other question I ask is, if in that case, in the, exa in the example I gave, uh, it would not be covered by the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties because the European Union is not a state, would that be a source of uh, legal obligation under international law, given that the European Union is not a state? Yes, it can be established as a customary international law, uh, depending on how long it's been around for and, and whether it's uh, recognised to be legally binding. How about as a convention? Would it be considered a convention, given the fact that it is an agreement between states and a non-state, which is the European Union? Would that be considered a convention under international law and therefore a source of legally binding obligations under international law? Uh, I believe so. It just wouldn't come under the Vienna Convention. Very good. That's correct. Uh, that's good. So it is an agreement between states and an international organization. That's good. Um, the other question I have relates to the uh, United Nations Working Group, Human Rights Working Group. The question I'd like to ask is, as far as Julian Assange is concerned, would it have been possible for him to come before the European Court of Justice and use the report of the United Nations Human Rights Working Group as evidence that there is a violation of international law. In other words, my question is, does the report of the United Nations Human Rights Working Group constitute as a source of international law? It's a more persuasive source. Mm -hmm. So as your feedback to us. I previously made that mistake because I thought that it's an independent expert and they use international law to provide their opinion. Mm. That's why I draw a connection and thought that it is legally binding mm. uh, because their opinion is based on international law. However, the states are able to disagree with this direction and this opinion. That's why it's called opinion. Mm. And obviously it is not legally binding. So states can walk away from it as we can see with the UK and Sweden. Mm. That's why it's, it would be pretty shaky for him to go with it mm. uh, to International Court of Justice. Very good. Um, that, so that's correct. Now, the, the other question I have in relation to that um, is, hang on, kind of losing the, the train of thought here. So in, in relation to that, could it not be a source of law under uh, the uh, International Court of Justice statute being potentially uh, a subsidiary source of law being a, an opinion of highly qualified publicists? It's still, it's just an opinion. It's still not, um, like you can, you can view it as a source of law, but mm -hmm. other states 
still can disagree with it. So that's why in the case of Julian Assange, although what we can see that a lot of experts came out and they said it would be very disappointing if UK doesn't comply with the recommendations of working group, United, United Nations working group opinion, um, because they are part of United Nations and they're the leading participant. Mm. And if they set the precedent of not com complying with it, mm. what it would mean in the future for other states can they just, is it pointless completely to have any opinion of um, experts on human rights and international law? What is the point for them to give opinion if the states don't agree with it? Let, let me just clarify there, Marina, something that you said. Is it the fact that it is a, an opinion which makes it not a potential source of international law? Because what we need to remember is that the opinions of experts in international or of highly qualified publicists are deemed to be a subsidiary means of international law, as a source of law. So they're opinions. So the mere fact alone that it is an opinion does not mean that it cannot be a potential source of international law. What makes the opinion of the working group or the United Nations human rights not a potential source of international law? It can be because it's an opinion. I think it's, it just doesn't have um, like very strong legal force to... Can I, can I jump in there, Marina? Yeah. Yes, Ravan. Uh, I was just going to say, although the UN panel is made up of experts in their field mm. and um, has a... Um, is widely accepted as knowledgeable in their field, which is why they're picked to be on that panel. Mm. The panel itself has no legal authority. Mm. And that's what makes the difference between it being an opinion and it being legal um, authority to actually make a decision um, mm. that is binding. Okay. And the other point there is that uh, although they're experts, they're not presumed to have the same qualifications as highly qualified publicists that would have uh, allowed their opinion to be a source of international law. So they may be experts, but they're not necessarily uh, opinions of highly qualified publicists. They're not the same. So there's a international law uh, provides a different uh, quality to the opinions of highly qualified publicists as opposed to experts of international law. So not every expert of international law is given the same status as of a highly qualified publicist as a source of international law. Okay. Um, are there other questions from the class? I've got one more question. If there isn't any. Sorry, can I ask another question? Michelle, yes. Right. Hey, um, Reese, you spoke about the EAW. I was wondering if um, Britain's exit from the European Union has affected the extradition laws between um, UK and Sweden now? Well, it's a, a pretty topical question, isn't it? Because, um, you know, that's only recently happened. However, at, at this stage, uh, there is no effect because the United Kingdom hasn't actually left the European Union. Other questions for the class? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for asking the question. I thank you, Reese, for your answer. I'd like to um, follow through a hypothetical scenario that was raised by Peter earlier on the assumption that at some point, Julian Assange decides to leave the Ecuadorian embassy. So let's assume Julian Assange does that. Now, let's assume for the moment that there has been a change of power in the UK. And in fact, there has been one. So we have a new prime minister there. And let's assume that the new, that the new prime minister of the UK is inclined to actually uh, be more protective of Julian Assange. And let's assume, therefore, that uh, the UK Prime Minister would then say that there is a law in the UK saying that they cannot extradite uh, Julian Assange if the basis for an indictment in the US is uh, political. And the WikiLeaks uh, issue, for example, can be claimed to be a political one. 
So the, 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 the international question I have is this. Would it be uh, legally permissible for the UK to uh, cite its internal law as a way to avoid its uh, treaty obligations under the extradition treaty between the US and the UK, assuming that because of a change of government, uh, the UK government is now inclined to protect Julian Assange and Julian Assange is willing to step out of the Ecuadorian embassy. So can the UK use its internal law as a way of avoid avoiding its international obligations under the extradition treaty with the United States? I can have a go at answering that, Manjo. Whether I'm on the right track or not is another matter entirely, but I'll give it a go. Mm -hmm. um, so if um, he was to step outside, he could still be arrested on, on the fact that he broke his bail. Mm -hmm. um, even if the extradition to Sweden wasn't going to go ahead, and we're just talking about a non-extradition to the US, mm. um, if there then was a law saying that the UK would not agree to political extraditions, mm -hmm. he could still face arrest for the breaking of the bail. Mm. But also that depends on whether the US will then come up with some other kind of charge um, so using a carriage service for um, releasing um, documentation without permission. There are other ways around to make it a non-political offence. Yeah, thank you, Siobhan. But my, my question really was whether or not the UK would be in breach of its international law obligations if it cited its international, in, internal law, its domestic law, assuming there was one, which uh, would have prevented uh, extraditing uh, Julian Assange to the US. So in other words, can a state cite its domestic law as a way of avi avoiding its international law obligations under a treaty? That is the question. Okay, then I would have a stab in, uh, stab in the dark and say no, they can't. Um, because it would be, the law would have to have been applied retrospectively. This case is going back to 2012, mm. uh, when he broke his, um, his extradition and broke his bail and fled to the Ecuadorian embassy. So it would have to be retrospective by four years, um, I think, in order for it to apply. And in any case, I don't think they could apply it. That's, that's a guess, I will admit to that. <laughs> How about the rest of the class? I'm not, I mean, from the group. Uh, I'm not sure if I got the answer that I wanted. I'm just trying to remember. Oh, go, on. go on, Dean. I was going to say, you're referring to the sovereignty that um, the UK would always have um, on the hierarchy of laws, our internal law um, would, should, should uh, be able to override. Um, the obligation, there'll be repercussions. Obviously, if there's a, a get out of a, a leaving clause in the um, the treaty, they can abide by it. But uh, uh, it shows down to what repercussions. Um, and you can look at the, I guess, some of the other um, judgments that have been ignored, so to speak, by the country. So they still have their, um, their sovereignty and can um, basically do what they like um, in, in, internally inside their country. Mm -hmm. um, and ignore international obligations. Hmm. Okay. Rhys, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, actually, I was going to disagree with that. But, uh, <laughs> I, just, uh, I, I can't remember the specifics, but I, I do remember that it, it wasn't really an option just to say we've had a change of government and, and so now that we, now we uh, release ourselves from uh, a treaty obligation, I think there needed to be something more substantial. I, I I apologise, I can't remember exactly what those reasons were, but um, I, I don't think that the UK could just step out of a long-held treaty with the United States um, just because of a change of government. Rees would actually be correct. So a, a state cannot invoke its uh, own domestic laws as a way of avoiding its international obligations. So there would be a breach of international law in that case. But... Dean is also correct that in saying that in really if the question were to come before a UK court, a local court, then obviously the local court will likely uh, put more importance or value to its domestic laws and probably say 
that uh, it is the UK court, uh, it is the UK law which will actually apply. Uh, especially in the especially in the UK, because uh, as far as the UK is concerned, because in the absence of its written constitution, it is impermissible. So courts in the UK have no power to strike down a a parliament a, a legislation coming from Parliament. So the so UK courts don't have the power to invalidate a, a legislation coming from Parliament. So for that reason, if the UK uh, Parliament were to pass a law that would enable it to violate, for example, its uh, extradition treaty with the United States. It, it will be like, it will, what the UK court will do will, will be to, uh, to uh, respect the validity of that law. Now that is, uh, of course, uh, with, uh, different from uh, the international obligations of the UK, which it might be violating. So you see, you make a different distinction between international obligations and uh, the way that a UK court or a domestic court is likely to rule on the question. Okay, so I just asked those questions for the purpose of uh, you know digging deeper into the international principles. Would there be any other questions before we end tonight's session? None. So thank you very much, Marina, Dean, Reese, and Siobhan. You did quite well both in the uh, written submission as well as in the Zoom presentation. And I thank uh, the other participants tonight, uh, especially those who asked questions. We had uh, Peter and uh, who else? My memory isn't too well. Uh, Megan, I think, Megan as well, who asked the questions. Thank you. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you next week. Well done, uh, the group. Thank you, Manjo. I'm sorry. Before you sign off. Okay. Good night, everyone. Sorry, Manjo. Manjo, was there a question? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, um, Michelle also Michelle. asked a question. Yes, Michelle. Yes. Um, I've just got a question about giving peer review marks. Yes. Can you? It, it might be entirely obvious to everyone. Um, percentages mm. and fractions aren't my strong suit. Um, so, are we supposed to? set it out to each of our team members, obviously not ourselves. Yes. Um, and then under each of those box, give them a mark out of 25%, then 25%, then 50%. So give them a mark out of 100%. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, for instance, are you offsetting one person's contribution against another person's contribution, or can each of your team members all make 100% of their own? Um, we, we will end up with an average of all the peer review marks for another member. And it will be that average which will then be used to uh, adjust the final mark of a group member. So let's right. say somebody gives 90, another one gives 80, another one gives 75. We do an average, uh, the mean average, and that mean average should be used to adjust the, the individual mark of a group member. Okay, all right. Okay. But, but each member gets up to 100% based on our opinion of their contribution. Yes, that's right. No worries, thank you. Okay, thank Sorry. you. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. I'm just, uh, was there a template for it? Because it said yeah. in the assessment there's it a link. It is in the Moodle page. It is in the Moodle page. Uh, if there's a, a Word document. On the Moodle page, okay, okay, mm -hmm. I'll have a look. There's a Word document there. Okay, Sorry. thank, thank you, you very much and well done to the team. Uh, to the group thanks. and thanks Thank uh, to the rest of the class for engaging. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks, man. Good, Good night. Good night, guys.